morning, everybody. My name is Chris. For those of you who don't know me, Chris Dagan. And uh, this is the first time we've been here, so I apologise. I don't know who any of you are. But uh, praise the Lord for his goodness in being able to bring us together. Amen. All right. Well, um, yeah, so we're missionaries in Papua New Guinea. Uh, my, se- my wife, Sarah, and the four boys, Joshua, Micah, Simeon, and Reuben. If you can remember those, by the end of the day, you're doing better than me because you know who you're yelling at, Joshua, Micah, Simeon. Bah! And uh, so thanks for having us in today. And uh, it's a shame Pastor Mitchell isn't here as well, but I did meet him a couple of weeks ago down uh, at YE at the Preachers Conference thing down there. But um, yeah, so I'm going to show some photos of Papua New Guinea. So we've been up in Papua New Guinea for the last, well, we've been in Australia for this year, but we've been up in Papua New Guinea for the last three years. And uh, I've been going up and down over the past few years. First time I went in 2003 uh, as a family. We lived up there for a year in 2011. uh, And then we've been up in Papua New Guinea for the last three years before now. And uh, so thank you for praying for us. I think Pastor Mitchell said you do pray for us and get our prayer letters sometimes. So if you do, thank you very much. And uh, so we'll just have a look at some photos here of Papua New Guinea. Some of the ministries that we uh, do up there in the church and some of the people up there and what it's, a bit, what it's like a bit in Papua New Guinea. And so, yeah, this is, um, this is a RI. We teach RI up in a number of the schools up there around the place. Um, praise the Lord for the opportunity to be able to be in the schools to teach our right to the kids. Um, in Australia, I know now it's really quite difficult to be able to get into the schools and there's a lot you can't do and you can't say and you can't talk about, uh, things like that. And kids have to have a written letter to get into RE in the first place. But um, here we've got the whole school. So praise the Lord for the opportunities there to be able to teach our right. They're the little kids. This is a high school up there. And again, we've got the whole school there and RI is part of the national curriculum and so they're happy for us to be in there and uh, so praise the Lord for the opportunity to be able to preach uh, to the kids because as you know you know a lot of them don't come to church and they don't come to Sunday school and some of them are you know go to other churches and Seventh-day Adventists and uh, just the village kids and so you get to speak to kids that you wouldn't normally get to speak to and there's a great opportunity there. Um, this photo is of a school graduation um, so they asked me to preach at the school graduation there. This is a grade two and three kids graduating and they get a certificate and they got them all to dress up in their uh, traditional clothing and come to school with their bows and arrows and tomahawks and everything like that. It's Pretty fun to go to school with a machete, hey? <laughs> well, you, sometimes you get into trouble for not doing it because you need to bring your machete to clear the grass and the bush around. So it's, it's cultural, okay? And uh, probably one of the last places you can still do that. But praise the Lord for these opportunities. And because it's in the village, this is in the village where we live in Kargu. And um, because it's in the village. Um, every, everyone goes to it. You can see it's not just the school there. It's the whole village comes to these, you know, it's like a big community affair. Um, and so you've got the whole village there. Literally, you've got 90, 95% of the whole village uh, sitting there in one place. And you don't normally get to preach to all of those people. So praise the Lord for uh, these opportunities. There's lots of good opportunities there for preaching and for outreach and uh, ministry with the kids, um, school holidays, youth ministries, things like that, little kids ministries for little kids like that. And uh, there's the church building there on the station where we live, a uh, small building, you know, not as big as this place and about half as many guys. But uh, it's, a, it's, it's good, you know, and the Lord's doing a work there and praise the Lord for what he has done, you know. Uh, praise the Lord for the work that he's done in the people. And uh, there's some of the people in the church there. Um, they're doing different meetings, uh, marriage seminars and different, uh, yeah, just all sorts. And Sarah does the ladies' meetings and things like this. So there's lots of opportunities there. And so just pray for us that we can have wisdom to be able to minister to these people uh, on their level. You Like a very low literacy rate, 
Um, you know, a lot of people can't read, and when they can read, you know, it's difficult for them to read with understanding, you know, to understand and take it in what they are reading. And so just pray um, that the Lord can do a work in these people's lives and that we can minister effectively to these people, uh, to the children, to the youth, the young adults, uh, and the ladies' meetings and different things like this, because there's lots of needs there. Um, you've got polygamy that's a difficult one I've asked pastors about that and they don't like talking about it um, but you've got all sorts of things and, and just like in Australia the same problems okay the same problems in New Guinea as in Australia we got drugs and we've got uh, all sorts of stuff we don't need to go into it all but um, praise the Lord for the opportunity that we have to be able to be up there so um, there's also lots of challenges this is a village out there a village called Irafo and um, that's where the, some of the fighting has been going on. There's been uh, some serious fighting going on over the past few years that we've been there for about two years. These guys, probably more now, maybe two and a half. So, yeah, it could be coming up to three years now that these, this village here has been fighting against themselves. Um, there are three clans and three grouped up against the one and then it all kind of went and they burnt their houses down and chased them off. And, and so this was going on over the past few years. This guy here at the front, that's Peter and he's a pastor that I work with there in Cargo. Me and him live on the station. He lives on one house. We live in another house and we work together for all of these things. He goes to all right different schools that I go to and, and we stick together and go around to these different places, to these villages. This village is about five kilometres down the road from us. We drive through this place and um, this is where uh, they went and did a great big attack and they traipsed over the mountain and did a big raid and killed 18 people um, over at another village. And so just pray. And there was, lots, there was fighting on three sides of our village at one point. It got pretty serious at one point. And uh, these are some of the weapons they've got. their homemade guns. They shoot M16 bullets. They buy M16 bullets from the police. So don't expect the police to go in and help you out if anything happens, because they won't. And um, so these is what these guys, these, are, these guys here in the village, they sit down and they, they're locked in their village. They can't go out, okay? So they're locked in their village because their other half of the village that they've chased off lives in town. And so if they go to town and their guys see them, they'll just shoot them down in the streets. And so they are stuck in their village and they're stuck in there. And so they weren't able to go to town and buy different things and, and they need weapons. And so they're constantly making bows and arrows and these guns. And I don't know how they're making them and they don't blow up in their face. But um, there's a pretty hairy looking one there. That's made out of a staple gun. Yeah, M6, that shoots M, that's an M16. And you know, the, the the, what do you call that thing? The staple guns, the hammer, to hit that thing off. So they're pretty nasty dudes. Uh, There's a proper M16. And uh, this is where they went out to the village. And so that was um, a huge, huge day. Um, as you can imagine, I got a text message saying, uh, Irafo village went over and attacked this other village and killed 12 people. You better go and see what's going on out there, kind of thing. And I'm like, uh oh. Pastor, where are your Bible college courses on this stuff, you know? <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> you yeah, pray. That's what you do, okay? So pray for wisdom. And uh, so that was horrific. It literally was. They burnt down several houses and, and murdered all of these people uh, from this village here. And this was the next day we went out there when it happened and we drove out and saw the people and took some people into town and tried to help them out as, as much as we could. And uh, these guys were all in shock, you can imagine. This is a house there these are the posts and they're still smoking you can't really see it I don't know if you can but that's a house there where they're standing and all these people were standing around and they're having their funeral and um, they had the people that were killed laying in one of those houses and well when we went out there I said can we come out tomorrow and I'll preach at your funeral and they were really glad for us to come out and uh, they respected us and said thank you for coming out you know no one else came out 
the police didn't come, the government doesn't come, the authorities don't come, no one comes, but you came. Like, why did you come? You know, we're in the midst of, we just got attacked and, and you came out to help us and to pray with us. And so we went out there and preached with them. And so, and they really respected us for coming out and they said, you're welcome to come out here anytime. And so just pray that, you know, maybe when we get back, we'll be able to strike up contact with these guys again and be able to go out there and, and have opportunities to preach, pray for someone to get saved, you know, we could start a little fellowship out there. It's on the road where we go to and from town, so we drive right through um, this place. So just pray for lasting peace. Uh, here's the guy at the funeral. They cover themselves up with mud and they wail, like really wail and cry and it's really quite distressing to see. And uh, so just pray for these people, you know, um, and we had a good opportunity to preach out there. This is a big grave that they were putting uh, six of the coffins in there. And even Peter, he's out, you know, he said, I've never seen anything like this before. This is just something else. And uh, so this was a huge thing for that village. And, and praise the Lord that they didn't want to fight back. They said, we're not fighting back. This is too big for us. Uh, we, this is too much. Um, they, we're not going to fight. We're not going to close the roads. You know, we, we didn't want this. Um, so just pray uh, for lasting peace between these guys. These are the guys here at Irafa. This is one of the peace talks that we were in. These guys here, these are the main bunch of guys. This guy here, uh, his name is Douglas. If you think about him, pray for him. He calls himself a Christian. And he says, we're Christians. And I'm like, well, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace. You know, not murder, hatred, violence, killing, you know, show us some fruit here. And this guy here, these are the two guys that the other guys want to kill off there. We'll kill them and then we'll make peace kind of thing, you know, kind of easy to make peace once you've killed your enemy, I suppose. Uh, so just pray. And this guy here and they're the guys. And um, this is one another little peace talk that we were in this village on this side and these guys on this side. And me and Peter were standing up in the middle and we preached and prayed for these guys. And um, just pray. Um, what we keep telling them, you know, it's good to make peace. But what we keep telling them is reconciliation with God. Amen. Uh, be reconciled to God. You can be reconciled to your enemies, but you need to be reconciled to God. That is the key. That's what Christ came for, reconciling us to God while we were enemies. Uh, these guys, it's a really good opportunity. We read these Bible passages where it says, love your enemies. And we go, oh, yeah, I just don't like this person. Okay, I'll love them. But they're not a true enemy. Okay, when you're talking to people who live like this, they know what it means to love your enemy. Because if I see my enemy, I'm going to cut his head off with a machete. And then you're telling this guy to love his enemy? Um, that's a challenge. And be reconciled. While we were enemies, Christ died for us. You know, while we were enemies. While we, while, like you think about what you want to do to your enemies, think about what God did for us when we were his enemies. Yeah, when we were enemies, Christ died for us. When we were shaking our fists and we didn't want anything to do with God, he still loved us. And, and so we preach that to these guys, reconciliation. And um, yeah, tons of opportunities here. This is a whole village from over the valley. They were threatening to kill someone from there. And we went and we spoke to these different villages and they came and made peace. Another peace talk here. This was down in Garoka. And so... Yeah, just pray for a lasting peace because quite often it's just like, yeah, we'll make peace and they'll shake hands and say sorry and yeah, okay, and they'll cry and, and, and give each other a hug and, and then next week, you know, somebody says boo and then it's all on again. And, and it's like, yeah, we thought you made peace. It's like, yeah, well, so did I. And, and then they, they don't. So just pray um, for a lasting peace. And, and peace with God because I tell them, you can be reconciled to your enemies and that's one thing. But you need to be reconciled to God because if you're not reconciled to God, you will die and go to hell. You can be reconciled to your enemies, but reconciliation with God is the key thing. And then once you're reconciled with God, he can help you then with reconciling you with your enemies. And then there'll be peace. There'll be a lasting peace. So just pray uh, for us to have wisdom as we go out and talk with these uh, men. It's all the men. And um, they're some of the things that we go out to. Um, this is a road. That's not a road, you'd say. But these are the roads that we go on. 
some of the logistical things about Papua New Guinea. Sometimes you don't get up the road and so you've got to pay these guys 50 bucks to pull you up the mountain while you're trying to drive up it. Um, yeah, these are the roads that we live. This is down into our house, so if you ever want to come and visit, feel free to come. <laughs> but if you don't like four-wheel driving, don't come. Okay, if you don't like sliding sideways down a mountain, it's pretty awesome. Um, even if you don't, that's the highway, the national, that's the, hi, that is the, that's the, uh, what are we on, the A1, is it the A1 down here, the Bruce Highway? That's the, that's the Highlands Highway that goes from Lay all the way across west, across to the country there, and there was a landslide there on the side of that mountain, and um, I asked pastors for the Bible College courses on these ones too, because we were coming up this mountain range in the dark one night, and it was raining, and it was fogging up in the car, and we couldn't see, and I was, I had my head out the window, you know, it was one of these ones, and, and all you can see is that line down the middle of the road, and, and I said, well, where's your Bible College courses on when you're driving up the mountain in the rain in the dark, and you can only see those middle lines, and you know that those middle lines go off the edge at some point and then I was just being cheeky and he says oh you just got to pray brother I'm like yeah it's easy for you to say <laughs> so they just dig into the mountain a little bit more to go around you can see there's the road there there's a piece so yeah some of the things that we get to contend with but it's always fun um this is in the village now this is where we live in Kargu um, so you can see the people live very simply. It's a very chilled out kind of today, tomorrow, next week, what difference does it make um, kind of lifestyle. And they live in the grass houses and they got their sweet potato mounds here. That's what they live on. So every day they go and dig a little bit of sweet potato and take it home and cook it up and sugar cane, bananas, cabbage, corn. And that's just how they live up there in the village in the grass houses picking coffee that's coffee if you're wondering what that is uh, that's one of their main um, incomes they get they get quite a bit of money from their coffee so they'll pick the coffee beans roll that rock over it get the skin off it dry the beans out for a few days in the sun and go and sell it get about two dollars a kilo so think about that when you're buying your starbucks fifty dollar a kilo gourmet papua new guinea coffee they only get two, but that's the bush for you. That's a, uh, they might be coffee trees back there, actually. Sometimes their coffee gardens are close. So this is just, this is life in the village, okay? So if you go walking down the village at any given time, particularly coffee season, you will see something looking like this. This is a grass house. This is inside the grass house. This guy's really sick. Went down and prayed with him, took him to the hospital and he was so sick the hospital just turned him around and sent him home and gave him a few days to live and uh, he actually died this man i went down and was praying with him and talking with him and this was the last day and um yeah so health services aren't that great it's difficult for them to get around it so uh, they can't get to the hospital at times especially when it's raining they had a really big rain just at the start of this year it was raining i was talking to peter for months and months and months and months it rained and rained and when it rains the trucks don't get through he says so we haven't been to town so they've got food because their gardens always grow but then they don't get to buy you know the salt and soap and cooking oil and all these kinds of things uh, if it's too wet you know your potatoes go rotten and things like that as well and so it's very difficult for them to get out hospital ran out of supplies things like this and so just pray that we can minister effectively to these people uh, this man just you know walking around the village talking to people he's an old man who's blind you just talk with them uh, talking with these people uh, this lady here washing in the creek washing their clothes on the log and wash their saucepans down there in the creek that's how they live so don't forget to love your washing machines people don't take them for granted and your dishwashers and your kids that wash up for you oh, you could be doing this and so it's a bit of a it's it's different life you know and then you know they travel their gear and they go that's a bush truck up there it goes up into the back up the mountain into the village and uh yeah so there's another cash crop. It's a big plant, big drug plant. And they'll sell that to buy some bullets for their guns, things like that. And some different people in the village. That's outside that lady's grass house. And um, yeah, you all think I'm short, don't you? Yeah, you thought I was short until you saw that. 
But um, just pray for these people, pray for us as we're up there ministering with these people, that like I said, we can bring it down to a bush level. You know, we, when we first get there, you know, you get all excited and you're like teaching and preaching and doing everything. And then after a while, you kind of, I think some of us was like whoosh, over their heads. So you've got to bring it right down to a level that they can understand. And um, we, we all preach in illustrations and examples and everything, yet they're cultural. They're all going out the window. They don't know what you're talking about. And so it's just all basic Bible basic Bible doctrine, basic Bible teaching, basic Bible studies that we need to give to these people. So, yeah, that's some Papua New Guinean photos. We want to move this pulpit back. And, um, yeah, so lots of work to be done up there. Pray for us. Um, our visa, we're waiting to get a visa. I think that is the number one trouble for all missionaries. Yep. It's on wheels. And yeah, praise the Lord. Yep. And so we're waiting to get our visa. Our visa expired. We get a three year work permit and visa. And um, we put our papers in to get submitted. And the agent, the man over in Port Moresby who was doing it for us, told us he put it in, but didn't and kept our money. And so we were waiting for a, a long time. And so that slowed things down. And then, you know, another agent got on board and discovered what happened because he didn't do it to us. He did it to about five other missionaries as well. So just pray for, pray for that guy, the Crows and Sam and another missionary, Tim Lewis, as well. He did the same thing, took our money and didn't give our paperwork in. And so that's held us up quite a bit. And so just pray that we can get our visas and head back up there. Amen. All right, well, if you've got your Bible... And you like to open it up to Luke chapter 18. We'll open it up to Luke chapter 18. And um, if you wanted to make a title, I guess we could call it, Who Are You Going to Follow? Who Are You Going to Follow? Uh, let's open in a word of prayer uh, before we start. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for today. Thank you, Lord, that we can come together and thank you for the work that you've done. Thank you, Lord, for the work that you're doing here and in Papua New Guinea, Lord. And I just pray that you help us now as we look into your word. I just pray you give us wisdom and guidance and teach us now, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, who, who are you going to follow? <clears throat> Let's read Luke chapter 18 and verse 18 down through to 27. It says, A certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good, save one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honour thy father and thy mother. And he said, All these have I kept from my youth up. Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, Yet lackest thou one thing, sell all that thou hast, and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. And when he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through the eyes through a eyes a needle's eye, than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they that heard it said, Who then can be saved? And he said, The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Amen. Who, who are you going to follow? Um, it, it's interesting to think, especially as a missionary, as a pastor, as a preacher, um, that even, and, and we worry so much, oh, we spoke to this person and they, they haven't called on the Lord yet. And uh, we've witnessed to this person and we've spoken to these people and, we, and we've invited these people to come along to church and, and they came maybe once or twice and then they don't come anymore. And you kind of get discouraged, don't you? We get discouraged sometimes, but even here, not everyone who heard even Jesus speak called on him, did they? Uh, even all of the people who Jesus healed, not all of them believed in Christ and were saved. You know, Jesus says, oh, you're only here because you want bread. 
you know, he fed all of these people and, and he heals all these people and he's speaking to this man here and, and he didn't respond, he responded to the Lord, he definitely responded, but he didn't respond the way we would like him to respond, did he? We want people to respond with a positive response to the Lord, but this guy was sorrowful and, and he went away and uh, that was Jesus' witness. That was Jesus speaking to him. You know, a lot of people say, if I saw God, I'd believe. If I heard Jesus, I'd believe. I had a friend tell me once, he said, if I saw an angel, I'd be the most goddest person there was. I love that he said goddess. It's such a good descriptive word there, unless you're an English teacher, I suppose. But I'd be the most goddest person. I said, no, you wouldn't. He didn't like it that I said that to him. Oh, if I saw someone go back from the dead, I'd believe. You know, Luke 16, the rich man. Send someone back from the dead and then they'll believe. Well, they had the law, they had Moses and the prophets. They've seen Jesus. Jesus has been. Jesus died and came back from the dead and not everyone believed. And, and people here make a decision. Everybody makes their own decision. And we would love to make everyone's decision for them, but we can't. Uh, but everyone makes a decision, and it's one of two roads, isn't it? You've seen the track probably, and there's like, oh, which way will you go? Or you got two choices on the shelf, or which road am I going to take? And the guy's got, got quite, have you seen that one? He's got a question mark, and he's scratching his head, and, and it's the fork in the road. And which way are we going to go? Which way are we going to go? At lots of points in our life, there isn't just one point in our life where we come to this junction. If you're not saved and if you don't know the Lord, there isn't just one opportunity where you come to this junction in the road where you need to make a decision. Even if you've never been in church, uh, you read through the book of Romans, it says that they are without excuse. The people who have never heard the gospel, even people who have never sat in church, I've had Papua New Guineans ask me and they say, what happens what, what happened to our grandparents and our ancestors? You know, the missionary never came. They never had a chance. They never, have, never had an opportunity. No, no one got to preach to them. They never got to sit under the word. They never seen a Bible. They never seen a white person. Uh, what, what about those people? Did they all go to hell? Well, if they didn't believe in the Lord, then yes, you know, all nature. The heavens declare the glory of God. There isn't a language or a tongue where it's not known. And it talks about them being without an excuse. There is no one who can stand up before God and make an excuse. Do you ever think about that? There is no one who can ever say, oh, I would have, but this person said something to me or, or that person did this or I was at church one time and, and, and I got offended by someone and, and now I've left. And, and, and God's not going to go, oh, okay, yeah, that's, a, that's a reasonable excuse. Yeah, that, that's, good. that's a good one. Yeah, I like that. I can handle that one. Yeah, come in. Welcome home. You know, that's not going to happen with God. We all at some point in our life need to make a decision for Christ or for not. And look at this guy here. He comes to Jesus and we'd be excited, wouldn't we? We'd be excited when we get someone and we're talking to them and they say, what do I need to do to get saved? You know, you read it in the uh, Acts 16, the Philippian jailer, and you go, what do I need to do? And we're all going, yes, you know, this guy's called on the Lord. He's got it. And Paul says, believe on the Lord and thou shalt be saved. And he does and his whole house and they're all baptized. And we're excited about that. And this man, he comes and says, Jesus, he says, good. Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And you'd be thinking, all right, this guy's going to get it. He's going to Jesus himself and he wants to know what he can do to be saved. What can I do to inherit eternal life? And, and we're, he asks, we're getting excited. Aren't we? He's so close. Pray for this man. He's going to get saved. And, and Jesus gives him the answer. Whoa. He goes, yeah, all, all these things are, I've kept. I've kept all these things. Yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. You're a religious person. Yeah, good. Yeah, all right. Yeah, you kept the law. Yeah, good. I haven't committed adultery. You haven't killed anyone. Oh, well, that's good. I haven't stolen anything. Yeah, I haven't borne false witness. You've honored your father and mother. Yep, yep. All of these things. Chick, 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 tick the yes box on all of those ones. Yeah, and he goes, I've kept all these things. Jesus is saying, well, that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? You know, Jesus knows the heart, doesn't he? Jesus knows the heart. He knows what to say to this person. We might go, all right, brother, praise the Lord on your knees. Let's pray. 
And you ticked all the boxes. Woohoo! You know, evangelism courses through here. Uh, he, his guy's got it. He, he, and, but Jesus knows the heart. You read that all the way through the Gospels when you read it, don't they? People aren't even speaking. Uh, Mark chapter 2, when he he heals the the man, you know, they lower him down through the roof and he says, oh, your sins are forgiven. And they're all in their hearts. They're moaning, going, who's this who can forgive sins? But only God can forgive sins. And Jesus knew their thoughts. And he knew their motives. And whenever they came, you know, the Pharisees and the Sadducees are always coming and they're trying to trick Jesus. And he, and he, he asks them a question back and then, he, oh, and then it says no one asked him any more questions. They're all afraid. And, and this guy here, he knows this man. Jesus knows this man. He knows his problem. He knows his sin. He knows where his heart is at. And he says in verse 22, it says, Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, Yet lackest thou one thing. One thing. Yeah, okay, there's just one thing you need to get settled here. One thing you need to sort out. So sell all that thou hast, and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Oh, that's the hard word, isn't it? Go and sell all that you have. Give it away. Give it to the poor. I found it interesting that he doesn't say give your stuff away. It's easy to give stuff away. Sell everything. Give your money away. And come follow me. Go and get rid of all of your junk. All the stuff that's holding back. Go home. Have a garage sale. Get on Gumtree. Sell it all off. Sell it all off. Give it away. And come and follow me. Ooh. Boy, that hit home, didn't it? You can see this guy. His heart sank. You can imagine his shoulders drooped. Oh, Oh, cut to the heart. You know what God's like. He can do that, can't he? And it goes, and when he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. His riches were holding him back. He was very rich. And his riches were holding him back from God. He says, go and sell it all, come and follow me. And he was very sorrowful. And when Jesus saw, look at this, 24, it says, when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God. It's hard for rich people to trust in the Lord. It's hard because they don't need anything. It's hard because they've got all of this and especially in the Jewish system back there, wealth was a sign of prosperity and blessing from God. And, and they think they're all over it and they think they've got it all sorted out. And he said it's hard for these people to enter into the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Whoa, and this one even shook the disciples. Look what it says here. And they that heard it said, who then can be saved? Well, if the rich can't do it, then who can be saved? They're the elite, you know, the poor people. It's not for them. You don't know what it's like. You've got the blind beggars and they're calling out to Jesus and they're all telling them to be quiet. You two beggars, you two blind people, be quiet. You know, shh, yeah, Jesus isn't for you. You know, and they're saying, blind Bartimaeus, Jesus, son of David, uh, you be quiet, you pauper. Be quiet, sit down. Well, if the rich people can't get saved, then who is it for? Who is it for? And I love this verse because God is the God of the impossible, isn't he? God can do anything. Do you believe that God can do anything? Yeah. Do you believe that God created everything out of nothing? Yeah. How did he do that? He did it by speaking. Uh, look at this verse, verse 27. It said, And he said, The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Uh, there's things that we can't do. We can't save ourselves. We, we can't do anything. It's impossible. And these things are impossible for us. And it says, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. And now you go back to this rich man here. He's made a decision. He stood before the Lord Jesus. Now, he's got no excuse, does he? 
He, he saw Jesus himself. He went up to him, and, and you know what it's like. Everyone wanted to see Jesus, even Zacchaeus, you know, the tax collector. He was keen to see Jesus. He's up in the tree. He's trying to see him. And everyone even, um, was it Herod? I think he wanted to see Jesus and hopefully see him do a miracle. You know, all these people wanted to see Jesus and this rich guy. And he comes up and imagine seeing Jesus. And he's like, there he is. And he's talking to him. Imagine talking to Jesus. And then he says, what do I need to do? And then he's faced with a decision and, and he's rejected the Lord. He's made a decision and rejected the Lord. He's chosen the things of the world over God, hasn't he? He's made a decision. He's chosen the things of the world over God and, and his riches. Jesus knows, he says, he knows, he points to us, doesn't he? And then he, he goes, Chris, yeah. how many times? Yeah, you don't need to know about that. But how many times has God gone, Chris? And he, and he points and you go, oh no, Lord, oh, I need to deal with that. Oh, I need to deal with that again. You know, and God's like, for the 20th time now. And we need to make a decision. We need to make a right response to go for what the Lord says. And now imagine this rich guy standing up in heaven before God. He stands before the Lord and the Lord says, well, I do. he's not even going to ask him a question. He's just going to say, I know, Lord, I rejected you. You had my son. You asked him what to do. He told you what to do and you rejected it. What, 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 what do you do now? What, this guy stands before the judgment throne and he says, yes, Lord, I know. No excuse. And I feel sorry for him. Don't you? I feel sorry for this man. I feel sorry. I feel sorry for religious people. I feel sorry for religious people who think that they're doing the right thing and they're going to earn their salvation and they think they're following God and they're given their whole life and they've devoted their whole lives to the wrong God. Have you ever thought about that? I feel sorry for suicide bombers. Well, this is going to sound bad, eh? I feel sorry for suicide bombers who blow themselves to hell. Whoa. Imagine the disappointment. You know, the heaven that those guys are promised or whatever they call their heaven, that they're promised and then, and then they wake up in hell. False assurance. How disappointing for religious people to be given their whole lives. I've done this my whole life. I've been going to a church my whole life. I've been giving my whole life sacrificially. You know, it says in Proverbs, even the sacrifices of the wicked are an abomination unto the Lord. They've been unsaved people. They can give. And, and people, and they go through their whole life and they've rejected their Lord and they're following something else or they're following another Jesus. Don't be deceived. Many Christ will come, Jesus says. They'll be many false Christs. Don't believe it. When they say they come, I remember reading some years ago, this guy who called himself Jesus, he was out in Siberia, out in the, you know, I don't know, somewhere, western side of, eastern side of Russia out there in Siberia, this guy called himself Jesus, and all these people were going there. It was in the Sydney Morning Herald some years ago. Uh, it, was, it was funny, but sad. A false Christs will come. Look out, I've told you. Okay, look out. Christ has already said that these things will happen and we need to make a decision to follow the Lord. What are you going to do? Have you made a decision to follow the Lord? If you are not saved, you need to make a decision, a conscious decision. Christianity or becoming a Christian, getting saved, isn't something where you just kind of, you know, you're just like suddenly, whoop, I've made the transition. I've gone to enough Bible studies, I've been to church enough times, I've heard enough things. You need to make a decision to call on the Lord and ask him to save you. Ask him to forgive your sins and, and ask him to come into your life or else you're going to be left outside and knocking on the door. And the religious people will say, Lord, Lord, we preached and we heard you, we ate with you, you taught in our streets. And he's going to say, I don't know who you are. We've done miracles in your name. I don't know you. Oh, don't you feel sorry for religious people? Don't be a religious person. 
Uh, we don't have religion. We have a relationship with the Lord. We have a relationship. We've been reconciled to God, haven't we? When we are enemies, Christ died for us. God said the wages of sin is death. Uh, like the brother said this morning, our sin has separated us from God. Before, in, in the garden, when God created everything and it was totally perfect, and Adam was there and God walked in the cool of the day. Imagine that relationship where every day God comes and walks down and communes with you and you're sitting in the garden and you're there with God and then that is broken. That's what God wants. He wants that relationship. He wants that fellowship with us. He wants that communion but the sin has separated us from God and we don't have that. We don't have that anymore and, and, and the wages of sin is death. He says if you do that, if you eat that fruit, you will die. That's sin and that's where sin came into the world, wasn't it? Turn over to Romans chapter 5 and we'll have a look at that. Romans chapter 5, and we'll see what Adam's sin has cost us. He's cost the whole world. When God made everything, it was perfect. It was very good. And now everything is under the curse. Creation is under the curse. And it, and it says, uh, Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, it says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. We have all sinned because of Adam. We are all sons of Adam, and we've all sinned, and we've come down. And But verse 19, it gives us the answer here. Look what it says. It points to Christ. It says, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made right righteous. That's talking about Christ. That's talking about what Christ has done. That's talking about Christ coming down to this world and walking around. And this man saw the Christ. You think this ruler, he saw Christ and he asked him what to do and he rejected it. And, and we, if we reject Christ, we'll end up in the same boat. But it says we, many are made righteous. We are made righteous in Christ. Not because what I've done, because that's impossible. See, with man, it's impossible. It is impossible for me to be righteous, but through God, all things are possible. I am righteous because of what Christ has done. Christ's righteousness on me. Amen. His blood has washed me clean. His blood will wash you clean. And we need to make a decision to follow the Lord, because if you don't, you'll miss out. And there will come a point where it'll be too late. It'll be too late. It says in 2 Corinthians 6, I think, it says, today is the day of salvation. Don't reject the Lord. Don't push him away. Don't put it off. You know, that's, that's the devil's trick, isn't it? The devil doesn't just say don't. He says, wait. Just, just wait. Wait, wait till next year. Wait, wait, wait till you've got something sorted out first. Wait, just wait. No, no, don't wait. Don't wait. Do it now. Call on the Lord. If you call on the Lord, thou shalt be saved. Look at uh, Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. Look at who Christ is. Acts 4, 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Only through Jesus. It's not through religion. It's not through doing things. It's not through buying your way in. It's only through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And you can have assurance. You can know you're saved. That's a good thing, isn't it? Assurance, assurance of salvation. How many people don't know they're saved? Uh, you ask anyone. You ask your unsaved relatives. I asked my pop, you know. My pop's not saved one time and he said, oh, I, yeah, maybe my, out, my good stuff will outweigh my bad stuff. Yeah. Yeah, you've all heard that, haven't you? Oh, I hope God's in a good mood when I die. Well, God is angry with the wicked every day. <laughs> He's not going to be in a good mood if you don't know him, you know? Yeah, but you can know you've got salvation. You can know. Hey, let's quickly turn there to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5, this is a great verse uh, about assurance. If you're struggling with assurance, learn this verse, 1 John 5.13. Turn to there. It says these things. Now, think about John. Eh? Think about John. He was there, wasn't he? 
You read the end of the Gospel of John, it says, I've seen these things, we've written them down. We can't even write down everything that we've seen and taught. And he's writing these down. It says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know you have eternal life. You can know you have eternal life. People don't know. People wonder and they spend their whole life in doubt and un uncertainty that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. You can know you've got salvation in Christ. You can only get saved through Christ. You can know you've got salvation through Christ. So what are you going to do? You're going to make a decision? You're making a decision right now. If you're not saved, you're making a decision right now. You're at this road and you're either going to go for the Lord or you're going to go for self. Well, that's it, isn't it? You know, the broad way and the narrow way. Matthew chapter 7, the highway, big broad way, which leads to destruction. What are you going to do? Are you going to go for the Lord or are you going to do it your own way? There's examples of people in the Bible. Daniel chapter 1, Daniel purposed in his heart. Christians, I like to challenge you to go on for the Lord too. If you're unsaved, make a decision for the Lord. If you are saved, make a decision to go on for the Lord and to be faithful. Think about Daniel. He purposed himself, he purposed in his heart not to eat the king's meat. Yeah, he made a decision. He made a decision to go for the Lord, to not defile himself. Daniel chapter 3, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Think about that. You all know the story. Bow down before the idol or you're going to be thrown into the fiery furnace. What did they do? They stood up. But before then, they'd purposed in their heart, they'd made a decision to be faithful, hadn't they? And then when you, when you, as a Christian, when you purpose in your heart and when you make a decision to follow the Lord, when the trial comes, you're going to be able to stand. You think if Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego didn't get together and pray first and be faithful in the beginning and they were faithful there with Daniel and then the trial came, the pressure came. <coughs> the pressure came and they'd made the decision and they were able to stand. And what a testimony that was. What a testimony that was of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Joshua says that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Yeah, what does it say? It says if you think it's evil to serve God and all this stuff and you want to go and worship these other idols and you want to go like everybody else and be like the other nations and you do what you want to do, that's fine. But me, my decision, as for me and my house... We will serve the Lord. He's purposed in his heart to follow the Lord and to make that decision to stand and not reject the Lord. So please, I'd like to encourage you today to make a decision to stand up for the Lord. If you are unsaved, make a decision to follow the Lord. If you're saved, make a decision to stand firm on what the Lord has done in Christ Jesus. Amen. He's done it all for us. When we were enemies, he brought us back. I was, you think about, well, there's too many illustrations. We could go on and on and on all day, but we better not. But make a decision for the Lord, please. As Christians, as a family, make a decision to walk with the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let, let's just pray. Lord, we just thank you for the word that you've given us. We just pray that you help us, give us wisdom and guide us and help us to make a stand for you, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.